My guest today is Glenn Block. Glenn, how are you, sir? Oh, uh, David, it's great, great to hear from you. I'm, you know, honestly, <laughs> probably not as great as I normally am with everything that's going on in the world, but uh, doing okay. I hope you're staying safe. I hope your family's staying safe. We are staying safe. Thank you for asking. I hope the same for yours. Um, my biggest worry is I have a large amount of family in Florida, um, and I have a father who is, uh, my dad is elderly and immunocompromised. Yeah. Um, so those are not two good combinations. He basically like stays in his house and doesn't go out, and he's fortunately okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I have a lot of family in Florida. They're the ones I worry the most about. Um, but uh, yeah, also just looking at the state of the world and all the recent injustices that we've seen, uh, which is a topic, I guess, for another show. <laughs> yeah, I know, you're passionate. I know you're passionate about racial justice, but we will have a whole show on that. Um, yeah, Perfect. well, I, I, I hope your family's staying safe. I'll say a prayer for them. And, Thank you uh, so much. The, and, uh, uh, I wanted to say I really appreciate, David, you know, since we're connected on Facebook, the one thing that you – uh, always remind me of is the importance of being grateful oh, for yeah. the things that we have. And oh, uh, I remember when you first started really instituting that practice and you've kept with it. And I, I love that. Oh, thanks for saying so. I do it for myself. I wake up every morning and think of something I'm grateful for, but I share it and hope um, it's good to know that other people get something out of it. Uh, let's talk about something positive. <laughs> let's talk about uh, photography. I know you're really passionate about photography and specifically astrophotography, which is right. a word I don't hear very often. Tell me about that. Yeah, sure. So um, astrophotography is connected to astronomy. Um, so when I was a kid, I loved to look at the stars. And uh, I'm still a big kid in many ways and recently decided, okay, well, I should get a telescope. So a couple of years ago, so there were whole communities, and this may be new for many of your listeners, there were whole communities of amateur astronomers throughout the world. Um, and this has been for a long time. It's not new. But what is new is the technology has gotten better and better um, so that you can get, you know, the average person, um, it's much more accessible to get a telescope that is way, way more powerful than what you used to get even 20 years ago. By and accessible, you mean more affordable? More affordable, yeah, more affordable. Still not cheap to get a good telescope. So that was the first thing I learned, that those scope kits that like they sell for kids, they're just really not great. Like you can like look at a few things, but one of the things that's really important when using a telescope is having a good base, a good mount that is stable, okay. uh, because what's happening is like the earth is moving and the stars and things that you're looking at are moving. And to really be able to get like a good view you actually need what is called a tracking mount. So a tracking mount actually moves with, as the Earth is moving, the tracking mount is adjusting so it can keep the things that you're looking at um, focused and, really? cent and centered. Yes. A automatically it does that. Automatically, yes. Hmm. Automatically. So I bought my first telescope, and there are two primary types of mounts. Um, one is called an alt-azimuth mount, and another is an equatorial mount or a German equatorial mount. The German equatorial mount is much more accurate than an equivalent alt azimuth at that price level, though there are higher level alt azimuths that cost way more. Like to give you an idea, like a really good alt azimuth mount is like $5,000. That's just for the mount, forget about the, tel <laughs> the telescope. So it is, it's definitely not cheap to go up to that level. But you can get an equatorial mount for let's say eight or nine, like eight hundred dollars, that really tracks very tightly uh, with the movement of the Earth, um, and they align actually off of a star, which is Polaris. Uh, Polaris is you know well known. The North like, Star. But the North Star, and the mounts actually align with that, and there's an alignment process that you have to do to get the mount aligned. So one thing I've loved about this whole thing is just. I came into this knowing nothing. I love learning. And it was just a completely different type of learning that I've immersed yeah. myself in since I started going down this path. So I started just with astronomy. So the difference between astronomy and astrophotography is that astronomy is where you are using visual. 
you're using your eye, you're looking through an eyepiece, and you are looking at the stars. And so you have a two core components you need to get into astronomy. Well, three. You need to have a telescope, you need to have a mount, which I mentioned, and you need to have the eyepiece. And the eyepiece is really where the magnification comes in. So there's a whole bunch of terminology. Yes. I so thought the telescope was where the magnification came in. No, so it's there's a whole bunch of factors, and I'm kind of like not the the expert on this, but basically what happens is telescopes have aperture, and aperture is like the size of the telescope in terms of how big it is. The aperture determines the amount of light that the yeah. telescope itself can capture, but then it's the eyepiece itself that handles the magnification. So the way that telescopes work is you like you get a telescope and then you get different millimeter eyepieces that are useful for giving different levels of magnification. Okay. So yeah, it's it's a little bit different than you might think, but there are limits, max limits depending on the size of the scope of like how much you're going to be able to see and how much magnification you'll be able to get. So the scope does matter but it's not enough. Like you have the scope and it has its limits. Um, and they talk about this F factor, uh, which, which determines kind of uh, gives you a sense of like how much viewing area the telescope has and how much it's going to be able to capture. So it gets really complicated and I don't want to bore the listeners, but it's a lot of interesting, I'm bored. <laughs> it's a lot of interesting stuff that you have to learn. Um, and then you have all kinds of components that you can add on top. So you have the eyepiece and the telescope, and you have the mount, but then you have things called reducers. So a reducer basically is almost like a zoom out in a way. Um, you, are you are increasing the field of view okay. that you're looking at. Um, and so like if you want to look at certain objects in the sky, um, you need to have like a larger field of view to be able to see more. So a reducer, and it's just amazing. I mean, as I've learned so much about like light and optics, just kind of getting into this world more than I ever knew. Uh, but then you have the reverse of a reducer. You have a thing called a Barlow, which is like a zoom. So if I want to look at, say, Jupiter, look at a planet, and I want to get a closer up look than what my telescope gives me using, uh, using the eyepiece, I can use a Barlow, which you, there's always a trade-off and you learn that. Like if you're going to zoom in, you're going to lose some detail. Like you might okay. see more. So there's all these trade-offs you have to think about. Um, and it certainly appeals to the engineering side of me uh, and the programming side of me because you just have all these combinations of things you can do. And as a programmer, when you're designing software, you know, you have all these combinations of things you can do. And it's all really about like, what are your requirements right so when you get into doing astronomy you have like uh looking at planets but then you have this other concept called deep sky and deep sky is really where you're looking at nebulas galaxies things that are very very far away so as soon as you start getting into deep sky objects particularly the co the question of exposure comes up because the deep sky objects some of them are, are very, very far away and don't emit a huge amount of light. And this is where astrophotography comes in. So take the Orion Nebula, which is a very large, ne a, relatively a very, very large nebula. Right, now, what is a nebula? Um, a nebula is like a high concentration of stars. Um, there are clusters too, so there are star clusters. Nebulas also tend to have like gases and different colors. So you've seen like that's a little bit different than a galaxy. Um, so there's, there's all these different types of objects in the sky. Um, and so, um, but the Orion Nebula is well known and you can actually, the Orion Nebula lives in um, um, the uh, Orion constellation. So if you look okay. at the Orion sure constellation, that. there's like his sword and, yep. and, and midway between the sword is the Orion Nebula. And you can actually see it with binoculars. So to restate my point, you don't need a telescope per se. You can use a camera with a telephoto lens. You can use binoculars. Um, it's just that the scopes, there are specific types of cameras which are called astrophotography cameras. 
These are cameras that you hook up to the back of your telescope, and then you hook them up to a computer. And what's different about them is they are designed specifically for deep sky, for, for taking, or, or for planets. So your average camera that you get is not. Like, you can do it, but it's not really tailored in terms of the sensor and so other things. This one right here would be okay, but I could do that. I mean, it, dep it depends on the camera. So, the, so actually, the Canon EOS that you have, yep. that is a popular camera that people use for astrophotography. Really? Um, yes, because you can actually get an adapter to hook uh, like a 35 millimeter camera or an SLR camera up to a telescope. Oh, um, the the Canon, telescope just becomes my lens. Exactly. Yep, that's exactly true. But the AP, the astrophotography cameras can go further because of what they're because they're designed specifically for that purpose. But the thing about the Canon, I'm not the expert on it, but what I know about the Canon EOS is that it has a sensor that. So, so one of the problems you have when you start to look at the sky is there are light waves uh, uh, that standard cameras actually deliberately filter out. And so I think the thing with the Canon is you can actually disable some of that filtering, which yeah. allows you, like, if you're looking at nebulas and other things, to get, like, a better view. Mm -hmm. Anyway, astrophotography is a whole other ball of wax because with astrophotography, so what you're doing is, I mentioned how you're looking at some of these objects that are really, really far away, and your eye can only see so much. So if I look through a telescope at the Orion Nebula, which is pretty big, I'll see like a grayish thing. It's cool, but it's nothing like what I can see if I actually use a camera. Because if I use a camera and like an astrophotography camera, what I start to do is longer exposures. So I might have a longer exposure of like 30 seconds. That means it's capturing light for 30 seconds, whereas the human eye is only going to capture that light for a moment. So that's going to really bring out a lot of the colors and other things. Um, once you go down that path, like if you get into the astrophotography world, like you'll get up, you'll go to these star parties. Uh, we have them here. So you need a to star travel. party. <laughs> it, it really is a thing. That sounds like fun. It is fun. Um, so one of the biggest challenges you have when you're dealing with astronomy and dealing with astrophotography is uh, light pollution. So you want to get away from the light pollution to places where there's dark skies. So most people that are into astrophotography, if they don't live in an area like Seattle, is not dark skies. No, neither is Chicago. You can do astrophotography, though. It's just not going to be as good. Yeah, um, I, I live right downtown. It's very well lit. Uh... Exactly. So I live in Seattle, and I live a little bit in the outskirts of the main city, but it's still a lot of light pollution. So what I'll do is I'll travel, like if I really want to get good shots, like I can get decent views an hour away by on the other side of Snoqualmie Pass where the skies are darker. But if I really want to travel, there is actually a place called Goldendale, which I've not yet been to, which is about three and a half hours away. And there's an observatory there. And there are places called dark sites. Dark sites are places that scientists measure the light there, and there's a rating, which you may not have heard of, called the Bortle rating. The Bortle rating is how you measure the darkness of skies. So if you can get like a Bortle rating of, uh, uh, I believe it's the the lower the Bortle rating, the better the viewing. Um, mm -hmm. And so you have places where there's like a Bortle rating of like one, which are like the darkest skies. If you go to the Grand Canyon, it's this way. And uh, so... Yeah. It's so a very little extraneous light from uh, the outside world, from the Earth. Exactly. And that is like a haven for astrophotographers. Now, what does it look like? So first off, you have to have a ton of gear if you go down the telescopic route because you need a battery. So I just bought, like, you need, like, a power station. You need a computer because you're doing imaging. Because what you basically do is, so I mentioned about how you have images with longer exposures, but there's this fantastic thing called image stacking. So what image stacking does is you take a large number of pictures, mm -hmm. sequence, sequence and, you, and it might even be over multiple nights. And then using software, like Adobe Photoshop can do this. There are also some other programs like Deep Sky Stacker that... Um, and PixInsight is the one that all the astrophotographers talk about. 
uh, PIX insight that will combine all those images together to form a composite image. Hmm. And so when you go down this path, you end up like going to places where you set up your scope and you're there for like six, eight hours. And the scope is just taking pictures continually hmm. of the object in the sky that you're tracking. So you need a good mount that right. can do tracking that you configure it against the thing that you're looking at. And then you have software that needs to basically like capture that because these cameras, what's different about these astrophotography cameras, they don't keep anything on the camera. You hook up a USB cable from the camera to a PC and it's feeding all the images. Well, this is where power becomes really important because most laptops, when you're doing imaging, it is actually really processor intensive. That means your battery is going to die quick. So this is where uh, you need to have power, but you also need to have a computer that uh, you can get a reasonably sized battery to keep it going for a long enough period of time to do imaging. And that's why the astrophotography community, the modern community, gets into buying mini PCs. So I literally just bought one. Intel has a PC called the Nook NUC. And those things run at like six amps an hour. So they're really small and they use very little electricity. So I can hook them up to a power station that has say 500 amps and I'll be able to power it for like 10 hours. Whereas Max, like my Mac uses like 85, you know, well, it's watts actually, sorry, not amps, watts. You know, Max use something like 80 watts an hour. So like yeah. you would need like a really expensive battery to be able to power a Mac. And it's just not the right thing. You really want to get something really lightweight that is attuned uh, to doing it. So anyway, I'm just giving you a lens into this world. And then when you capture all the images, that's just the beginning because then you need to post-process them. So when you see those fantastic images of like uh, galaxies and things like that, mm -hmm. you, there's probably been 10 hours of post-processing all the images together and running algorithms and other things to really clean it up. And I am just a baby in that. I am just the beginning of that journey. Um, and there are some folks that are super committed. They go out like every weekend and, you know, that's not me. But it does take a lot of time even to just wade in, uh, which is tough. Is that is that the image stacking? Is that the, the processing you're talking about? Well, the image stacking is one thing that happens where you just take all the images and combine them. But then there's just post processing to bring out the detail um, because, you know, basically like the waves of light that are captured, some of them are visible, some of them are not. So you just do there's just a large there's like tons of different workflows where you feed it to this application to do this level of post-processing and then you feed it to this application and it's, yeah, it's... I'm it's fascinated by that. Is, it, is this a hands-on thing or is it something you just you feed it to a workflow and kick it off and then go uh, have lunch or, you know, go come back in a few hours uh, start, or are you sitting there babysitting it and tweaking it along the way? I think it's a mix. Um, you know, like you have processing that you can kick off that runs for a few hours, but you might let it sample a bit to check and see like, how's it going? Is it is it going in the right direction? And yeah, it's overwhelming. You, you literally have to just like chill getting into it. And so the thing that's helped me the most is to surround me with a community of experts yeah. so that I can like ask them questions um, as I'm going through this. And I am literally just a baby. I mean, I may sound like I'm an expert. I know like less than 1% of probably what I could know but I know more than somebody who's never done it. <laughs> and uh, I have taken some good shots. The proudest shot I've taken was a picture of, was I captured the Whirlpool galaxy. Um, and it was amazing when I saw it like come up on my laptop and I'm like, oh wow, there it is. Wow. Um, it wasn't a fantastic picture, but in the beginning, when you first start to see things that you've never been able to see before, you're pretty excited about it. Are you sharing your work online somewhere? I shared some things on Instagram. I haven't done a lot, by the way. I've only done, a, I've done like some astrophotography of the moon, some shots of Jupiter. I just recently invested in a more sophisticated astro rig. So when I first got my telescope, I didn't get a telescope. I didn't spend a ton to get like a full astrophotography setup because I didn't know if I was going to be into it at all. And I right. was like, rather than... I mean, it wasn't cheap, but it was like it gets much more expensive as you get down the astro route. 
So I gradually got there. I actually started with a cell phone. So you actually have an adapter and the cell phones today are so powerful. You can do some astrophotography really? with just a telescope and an adapter. There's an adapter that goes on the eyepiece and you can put a cell phone on it. It's wow. not going to be like, you're not going to get to the level of what you can get with an AP camera, but I've taken like some amazing shots of the moon, for example, which I can share with you. Um, and I've taken some shots of the Orion Gal uh, Orion Nebula right from my cell phone in Seattle, actually, mm. like right in my driveway. And it came out pretty good. The other thing that's real interesting is there are actually light filters that you can use to help with the light pollution. So you can buy, you know, you got to pay for these things, but you actually have a filter that is attuned to the lights of the city. Like those Xeon, like those lights have a specific frequency. And so it actually helps to bring out um, things that you wouldn't be able to see without the filter. Oh, so it basically filters out uh, the, the, the known yep. uh, the colors of the street light, the, the frequency of that. Interesting. Um, are, are you writing about this? I know you uh, sometimes blog. I haven't blogged about astrophotography at all. I, I haven't really been blogging a lot in a long time, to be honest. My writing usually would be like Instagram, like Got I've it. posted. And it's not a lot, but if you check my Insta feed, which I can share, um, you'll see, you'll see like that photo of the Whirlpool galaxy that I was really, I'll send you the link to that one directly. Please. You can just open it from the browser. But I was so excited when I saw it and I was in Ellensburg, which is, no, actually I was at a place called Gold Creek, which I've gone to a number of times, which is about an hour from Seattle, but it's far enough away from the city that you get, I think it can be like Bortle three or four skies. The thing with the skies thing though, is there's a whole bunch of factors there too. It's not just the darkness of the area, it's the night. Like the particular, like what is the weather patterns like? Everything impacts your ability to do astrophotography. How much humidity is in the air? Uh, what is the cloud cover look like? And what is seeing? So seeing is actually based on the atmosphere. What are the atmospheric conditions? So yeah, there and there are apps. There are mobile apps that you can get, like not the weather app. There actually is like deep sky weather apps that show you, you give it an area and it shows you like, what's the scene going to be? What's the humidity going to be? What's the darkness going to be? So it's, uh, yeah. So you can plan it's, your trips to that three and a half not, hour drive. There are certain days toes. it's better to go out there. <laughs> yeah. Or for me, like I do this for the hour drive. Like there was a, a just a couple of weeks ago, I was going to go because I wanted to see the comet Neowise, which everybody and that you've been able to see actually with binoculars. And so I literally like looked at the at the apps and I was like, oh, it's going to be cloudy this day. This day looks perfect. So you actually and, and as um, as meteor uh, meteorologists have gotten better and better and the technology has grown and the ability to really forecast, they can see out 10 days based on weather mm -hmm. patterns. Um, so you, you, you have enough time to do some planning. I'm looking at your photo of the Whirlpool Galaxy on Instagram right now. It's pretty impressive. Oh, you found it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, tell, share with me uh, some of the equipment that you bought. What, uh, what telescope do you have and what camera do you have? And so well, on. I just upgraded to a whole yeah. new setup. Um, the telescope, the, the mount that I have now. So like initially what I had was Celestron. Celestron is a well-known maker of telescopes, and I had a Celestron Evolution, uh, a Celestron Next Star Evolution Eight was my first scope, and that has an alt azimuth mount that I was telling you about. The alt azimuth mount is not sufficient for doing long exposure astrophotography because the mount doesn't track as well. So these these are actually have computers in them, and you align them with stars, and once they're aligned, they have a they have a database of like 50,000 stars. So they can tell based on aligning with three stars and, and you putting in the latitude and longitude that mm. the scope can align. It's pretty amazing. It is fascinating. I love that technology plays, you know, in terms of your show, technology plays heavily in this, uh, yeah. you know, in this, in this hobby. So it's not an accident that me loving computers um, I mean, you already heard about me talking about hooking up computers to do imaging and other stuff. Yeah. It is, it is definitely a tech, a tech dream aspect to it. But I, um, but yeah, the alt azimuth mount was not as good. 
Then I bought an astrophotography camera, um, and the camera that I have is a ZWO ASI 294, uh, which is good for deep sky objects. I got it used. It costs almost $1,000 just for the camera new. Um, and I recently upgraded to now get a better mount. So Celestron makes, uh, and there's a bunch of companies that make equatorial mounts. I just bought a Celestron AVX. Um, which is a much better tracking mount. The thing about those mounts, though, is the alt azimuth mounts are easier to get up to speed. So I'm glad I went the route that I did because it less things I had to learn to get the basics. And right. once I got comfortable, then I was able to go to the next level. The alignment with equatorial mounts is 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 more difficult because you have to use weights to counterbalance, and you have to align with Polaris and a bunch of other things. So it's more work. So I bought an alt azimuth mount. I still have my same camera, and I bought a new telescope, which is called a Red Cat 51. Um, and the Red Cat 51 is a portable astrophotography telescope. So my my um, the mount that I had, I'm sorry, the telescope that I had from Celestron was an eight eight, uh, eight inch, so pretty big, eight inch aperture telescope, um, and it was a lot to transport it around actually. Right. Um, the new telescope is actually much smaller. You can even use it as a telephoto lens. It's designed, so you can actually put it right on a camera. Um, but it's great for my level of what I want to do. Um, and uh, yeah, so I bought that, but I bought a bunch of other stuff. I told you I bought the portable, the mini PC, um, and now I have the power station coming today. So I'm going to be at a place very soon. And it's like, as you're going through upgrading to get a proper Astro, it feels like there's always another thing you have to buy. So like I got into it and there were about 10 more things that I had to buy that I didn't anticipate. <laughs> That's just um, what they were hoping for. <laughs> yeah, you actually have guide scopes. So with astrophotography, I actually have a second telescope. And anybody who's been doing this for a while will not be surprised. But being new, I have a smaller telescope that goes on my main scope. And its job is to track a star. And as that, it just focuses, laser focuses on that star. And it can tell the mount to move if, the, if that star moves. So it's basically a way, because when you're doing astrophotography, you need really good accuracy right. in tracking. Um, because the more accuracy you can have, the more likely the software is going to be able to create those composite images effectively. So, yeah, I know this has been a lot. Um, hopefully it's given a lens, but I love it. I just yeah. love it because it was stepping into a domain that I knew almost nothing. And just a chance to learn something completely new, meet a new community. Yeah. I mean. And it and it actually brought interesting things in my life. Like I would never be like traveling out to like Ellensburg, which is like two hours away, to stay there till four in the morning <laughs> to, to to capture like you know shots of some object. But there's also a nice, I would say, fraternization aspect of it in the sense sure. that there are these communities, and Seattle has one, but any city does. If you look in, go online and search for astronomy community. I'm sure you have one in Chicago. And a lot of them get together monthly and you meet each other and they have Facebook groups and everybody's sharing and it's fun. It sounds like that's where you're doing most of your learning is from you found a set of peers and you're learning peer to peer sharing of knowledge. Is there is there somewhere else that you're learning? Oh, yeah, are there absolutely. online resources you're tapping into? Uh, yes, and books. And books? Um, there's, yeah, there's a bunch of books that people have pointed me to that I have bought. Um, a great one, let me run and get it, and I'll show it to you, um, that is a good one to start. Hold on one second. Okay, okay this, is, this is a little blurry, thanks to teams hiding my background, but this is called, <laughs> well, you know what, I'll just shut it off, why not? Uh, hold on, let's turn it off here. You get to see what I'm in right now. There we go. So this is Nightwatch. Um, this is called Nightwatch, A Practical Guide to Viewing the Universe. We're very fortunate where I live that we have a premier telescope shop. It's called Cloud Break Optics. It's where I bought my telescope from. And they've been a mine, they've been one of my primary resources. But as I've gotten friends, definitely like rely heavily on the community. But this is a great overview book that talks about everything from how to pick out a telescope 
to astrophotography, looking at deep sky objects. It walks you through everything from, and, and this was, when I bought my telescope, I bought this book the same day because they highly recommended it. Mm -hmm. So that's a good place to start. If somebody's yep. watching this show and they say, I want to get into that, step one should really just buy that book, look at uh, recommendations and then start thinking about equipment. Yep, and there is there is a great website that like the astrophotography community uses. Um, I'll tell it to you right now. Let's see, what is it called? There's like an there's Astro Backyard is one, but there's a there's a forum that like all the all the star folks use. Um, let me see which one is it. And I'm forgetting the name of it right now. Um, Cloudy Nights, yeah. So if you go to cloudynights.com, that is kind of like the haven for all amateur astronomers. So that is the de facto site. Uh, many times if you search on Google, you will end up at Cloudy Nights uh, if you have questions about gear. So it's a really nice community from what I've found. And um, generally, one thing I've really found welcoming is people don't make you feel dumb. Like, right. you know, you can ask questions and, you know, every once in a while you might get somebody who's like, oh, why don't you go to the beginner pages? But in <laughs> general, you find that people love this. And the other thing I love is sometimes I'll be at a site and people will come up and they'll have like their kids or people that have never seen, you know, stars before through a telescope and I'll show them. And like I recently showed a bunch of people like Saturn and they were just mm -hmm. like, wow there it is i see the rings and everything so it's 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 a great way if you're into it to kind of bring joy to other people that is cool and i'm looking at that site right now and the, the photos are amazing people yeah are they are the i can't i can't take i like i said the whirlpool galaxy one is probably the one that was the closest to anything that looks even close but it is so far off but just the fact that you could see it and see the arms and, you know, knowing that it's like 400 million light years away, wow. that to me was like really impressive. All we ever see of stars are Aren't their old photographs. Hold on. You, you said you have the photo. Let's just share it and show it. The photo Wait. of uh, the, the, the galaxy, the, the Whirlpool you, galaxy? Yeah. Did you go to Instagram on my... I, uh, I, I'm on the webpage right now. I can, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share it right now. Our viewers are watching it right now. Here is the... <laughs> It's right here, and then they can follow you on Instagram to see more. Awesome. Which puts awesome. pressure on you to post more. Awesome. <laughs> well, Glenn, we're just about out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. I learned a lot today. Yeah, thank you, David. This was really a pleasure, and this is definitely something that when you spoke to me last time, this probably couldn't have even been something we would have talked about because this is a very recent journey. Um, I think I just about passed my two-year mark because I think it was like August two years ago was when I got the itch. I went to a star party with a friend. Actually, that's the way I would say would be the best way to get involved. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's the books, but go get into the community. Like, look, look in your local city. Just type in star party. You will be surprised. You will get results. You know, like star party Chicago or astronomy Chicago and find the amateur astronomers group. And in general, I find them to be really welcoming. And you don't need a telescope. You can go out to one of those parties and look in different people's telescopes and talk to them. Uh, of course, a little challenging with COVID, wear your mask. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, you can do it even social distance. You just kind of stand six feet away and you're, and you're outside and you talk to them. But uh, that is what hooked me. It was actually going to a star party and realizing this is like actually a thing. Um, and then I just had to try not to think when I talked to somebody who told me they spent like $100,000 on their setup. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's a divorce if I do that. But, <laughs> but you don't have to start there. But just to set expectations, it does, you know, you're talking about a couple of thousand dollars to, to kind of really start to wade in. Um, um, you know, it, it's, it's, if you have a camera, that might be a way to start. You can actually get... Um, what's called a tracking mount for you can get a tracker for like 300 bucks um, mm. that will allow you to do some tracking and and you can take a lot of photos just with a camera and a good lens so mm. if you're already uh, a photographer you may already have the things you need to kind of wait in so glenn thank you so much you stay safe please awesome you too david <laughs> I'm
I'm really excited to have been able to share my passion for technology with my friends.